My name is Peter Bross, and I'm acting chief of the oncology branch in the Division of Clinical Evaluation in Center for Biologics Office of Tissue and Vast Therapies, and I'm going to talk to you today about FDA clinical regulatory perspective on designing first-in-human trials for cellular and gene therapy products. I have nothing to disclose. I'm an FDA employee, and objectives for learning today include provide an overview of cellular and gene therapy product development programs for the treatment of cancer, highlight challenges and opportunities to initiate first-in-human studies of genetically modified cells in immunotherapies, and summarize cellular therapies for the treatment of cancer that have been approved by FDA. And I'm going to start with two poll questions, which type meeting would not occur prior to an IND submission in CBER, uh, Interact Pre-BLA, Pre-IND, or, or a CAT meeting. We'll go over that. And poll question two, which primary endpoints are most appropriate for first in human study? Overall survival, safety, feasibility, dose finding, progression-free survival, or patient-reported outcomes. Today I'm going to talk about FDA regulation of oncology products, and then go into some specific cellular immunotherapies for cancer. Then I'll talk about some trends in IND cellular immunotherapy submissions at FDA, go over some clinical trial considerations for first in human studies, and then try to tie everything together at the end. First of all, regulation of oncology products occurs in primarily three different centers. Center for Drugs, which includes the Office of Oncologic Diseases, and they regulate drugs, small molecules, biologics, monoclonal antibodies, proteins, cytokines. CDRH includes the Office of Health Technology and the Office of In Vitro Diagnostics and Radiologic Health, which regulates companion diagnostics. Center for Biologics, where I work, includes the Office of Tissue and Events Therapies, Cell Therapies, Gene therapies, oncolytic viruses, therapeutic vaccines, and immunotherapies are regulated there. And all of the oncology activities and regulations are overseen by Oncology Center for Excellence. And primarily, I'm going to be talking about the Center for Biologics uh, today because uh, that these are the products that we regulate. Hey, okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about what type of cellular immunotherapies for cancer, types of immune uh, uh, cell therapies. First, um, uh, early on, we had immune ir irradi irradiated tumor cells where they would prick the cells basically with radiation and inject them and hope for the best. Then came non-engineered T cells, including autologous dendritic cells, autologous T cells that were expanded by cytokines and tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Hematopoietic stem cells also are considered immune cell therapies and um, are associated with uh, transplant, either myeloablative or non-myeloablative transplant. Engineered T cells came along and they uh, include engineered T cell receptor cells, uh, chimeric antigen receptor cells, chimeric autoantibody receptor cells, and CAR regulatory T cells and car expressing natural killer cells. More recently, we've seen an influx of edited T cells, either autologous or allogeneic, uh, edited by either telin or zinc thing, finger nuclease or CRISPR-Cas9. And more recently, we've seen an influx of allogeneic haploidentical natural killer cells and other allogeneic uh, products, and these are some illustrations of how these products are manufactured. The non-engineered immune cell therapies are procured by uh, apheresis. Engineered immune cells are also uh, procured by apheresis and are gene modified uh, with a viral vector in, in the process of manufacturing. Cord blood is a type of hematopoietic stem cells, which are uh, manufactured um, uh, by um, individual blood banks. This is an illustration of the IND 
applications for gene therapy products and trends in FDA submissions, shaded area corresponding to each year. And these are ongoing uh, studies you can see in the, in the brown um, in inactive studies and then uh, discontinued studies. And you can see that uh, ongoing studies have increased substantially in the past 10 years. These are trends in IND applications, which are sponsored by academic or commercial entities. And you can see a great, uh, almost logarithmic increase, um, especially in the commercial INDs over the past 10 years. The majority of IND applications are in solid cancers and hematologic malignancies, over 70%. And uh, this pie chart does not include information from uh, after the uh, coronavirus uh, epidemic because um, uh, in the past year we've seen a lot of applications for cell therapies, non-engineered cell, cell therapies for coronaviruses. There's been an upward trend in cancer cell therapy clinical trials in both hematologic malignancies and solid cancers. You can see uh, that uh, hematologic malignancies exceed the solid tumor applications. And among cancer cell therapy trials, CAR T cells are the most frequent the therapy type, and phase one, two are the most frequent trial phase. Most frequent target is CD19 of the hematologic uh, indications being studied. And in solid tumors, uh, there are uh, a number of different targets, uh, various tumor-associated anti antibodies, um, antigens, um, HER2, GD2, and this illustrates some of the other specific ones. What is not uh, illustrated here are the uh, neoantigen uh, uh, targets and uh, personalized medicine, which is also has been uh, uh, one of the more common types of, of uh, applications we've seen. So, considerations for designing first in human cellular and gene therapy studies. For cellular therapies, we're concerned with the possibility of secondary tumor for, uh, formation and migration to non-target sites and off-target toxicities. For gene therapies, immune responses to vector or the transgene are of concern and insertional mutagenesis causing secondary malignancies, which is why we need long-term follow-up. Invasive procedures may be required, which have carry some associated procedural risks and cells or genes may persist for extended periods to produce sustained effects. And these may intensify or prolong adverse reactions, and there are challenges to establishing tender, standardized approach for capturing these toxicities, uh, such as cytokine release. Dose explore, exploration endpoints may vary according to the different products, and vary between maximum tolerated dose or maximum feasible dose or the optimal dose, uh, depending partly on whether these uh, products um, expand uh, in vivo. Feasibility assessment of manufacturing, I think, is an important uh, secondary endpoint, and activity assessment and preliminary efficacy are also important secondary endpoints. Study design issues include Single-arm studies would generally focus on unmet medical need include, uh, and these would focus on relapse or refractory populations. There may be a potential for accelerated approval based on response in these population. It, however, contribution of effect is a challenge for combinatorial studies. Also, comparison with historical uh, uh, effects is uh, another challenge. Specific targets may require companion diagnostic, uh, and these may be antigenic targets, which are these assays are regulated in CDRH, and HLA restrictions, these assays are regulated in Center for Biologics. 
Companion diagnostics assays may require study risk evaluation, which is protocol specific, which assess whether subjects are forgoing standard of care and if subjects are in, uh, may um, be subjected to toxicities, unanticipated toxicities. Significant risk devices would require investigational device exemptions from CDRH. Endpoints for a single arm trial generally are safety, dose finding, tumor response rate, duration of response may be secondary endpoints, time to event endpoints are difficult to interpret in the setting of a single arm study, and historical controls may be unreliable. Randomized control trials are generally appropriate for later stage development, time to event analyses, including overall survival and progression-free survival, are the most common in randomized control trials. The appropriate control is required and should be discussed with FDA prior to study initiation, and it may not be feasible for certain products in a refractory population to do a randomized control trial, and all these issues should be discussed with FDA after you get preliminary clinical information. And we also have to consider potential confounding of concurrent treatments, such as lymphodepletion or the addition of checkpoint inhibitors. Dosing. Starting dose for first in human studies should be based on preclinical toxicology data informed by prior human experience with a similar construct, the doses should be based on transduced cells per weight rather than total cells generally. Dose escalation scheme, this should account for any anticipated cell expansion, anticipated toxicities, and we generally recommend half-log increments for biological drugs. These typically employ a three-by-three three design, however, other designs such as continual reassessment may be considered and Bayesian adaptive designs have been used successfully. Intrapatient dose escalation is not recommended and we do recommend staggering of treatment between subjects and dose cohorts. Sponsors should provide justification for the plan and the starting dose based on clinical and or pre CAR T cell toxicities that are expected include cytokine release syndrome, which may be of delayed onset uh, days or weeks. Cytokines released as the T cells expand and exert anti-tumor activity. And these may be associated with elevated cytokines and uh, certain clinical signs, including uh, uh, fever and um, hypotension. Immune effector Cell associated neurotoxicity toxicity is a well described entity that may cause re reversible neurotoxicity, including aphasia, and sometimes can cause severe neurotoxicity, including fatal cerebral edema. Prolonged B cell aplasia also is fairly common in the CD19 CAR T cell studies, and there may be other types of on target of tumor toxicities. TCR toxicities. TCRs may recognize self-antigens cause adverse events. Autoreactivity has always been a theoretical possibility, but SAEs have led to better understanding of the risk factors and the pathophysiology of these products. And there are new strategies to screen for autoreactivity before using TCRs in the clinical trials. Any TCR may be autoreactive, but the risk is higher for certain engineered TCRs. Non-human TCRs and enhanced affinity TCRs. And two uh, examples were, one was a mouse TCR targeted against MAGE A3, and there was cross-reactivity to MAGE A12, which was present in the central nervous system. Also, the TCR targeted against MAGE A3 and HLA01 caused rapid 
tar cardiac toxicity due to unexpected off-target TCR cross-reactivities with Titan. Management of toxicities. For a suspected cytokine release syndrome, include an algorithm for assessment and management, rule out other causes of fever, sepsis, drug reactions. Management of toxicity may include use of tocilizumab or other products that block cytokines and steroids, which of course would interfere with the T cell activity and expansion. And some products have built in suicide genes, so other other um, maneuvers may be appropriate. Should provide specific indications for supportive care, fluids, ICU, vasopressors, and cytokine sampling requirements should be pre-specified in the protocol. If subjects are discharged to outpatient care, they should remain close to the treating institution in case of delayed toxicities. Dose limiting toxicities protect subjects, identify optimum biologic doses, but they may be confounded by toxicities of conditioning, lymphodepletion regimens. The context is important. Some cytokine release may be expected. Severe cytokine release requiring ICU admission is generally a DLT and should monitor for off-target toxicities, cardiac, neurological, et cetera. And the DLT should be defined clearly. Grading of cytokine release syndrome is evolving. However, we have recently suggested reference to the ASTCT consensus grading from Lee from Biologic Bone Marrow in 2019. Examples of cancer cell therapy study DLTs include any treatment emergent, grade four or five CRS, grade three CRS that does not resolve to grade through two in seven days, and treatment emergent autoimmune toxicity greater than grade three. Study stopping rules provide for a temporary pause in enrollment and treatment of additional subjects, and specifically Studies should be paused with a, a death uh, potentially attributable to the study product or an increased incidence of expected toxicity over, uh, over that which is expected. Stopping rules should specify the conditions, such as the type and number of adverse events for temporary suspension of enrollment. Based on the outcome of safety assessment, protocol revision may be warranted including eligibility criteria does monitoring plan. Study stopping rules are not intended to terminate a study and, and uh, this decision is up to the sponsor. Safety monitoring, duration of monitoring for adverse events should be specified and may be discussed with FDA in a pre-ID context and should be sufficient to cover expected duration of event and safety monitoring may depend on information from preclinical studies and experience with related products. Long-term follow-up may be required for certain cellular and gene therapy products. There is a guidance cited below, 15 years of follow-up for integrating viral vector-based products. Clinical development can continue while the long-term follow-up is ongoing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about FDA review, which involves multidisciplinary uh, input, the uh, clinical review is informed by the farm tox reviewers and product reviewers, which are most commonly involved in early phase studies. And we sometimes include clinical farm input and for later stage studies, uh, statistical reviewers are involved. When to approach FDA for product development discussions. In the preclinical period, the Center for Biologics and OTAT have, uh, pre, in addition to the pre-IND meeting, we have two other methods to provide uh, uh, help to sponsors 
which include the interact meetings, which used to be called pre-pre-IND meetings, which are informal meetings to discuss primarily preclinical studies required and the uh, product uh, manufacturing issues. And there is also a CEPR advanced technologies team, and we have provided uh, information how to get uh, um, these um, uh, meetings. Then um, after the IND is submitted, we have uh, opportunities of end of phase one meeting and end of phase two meeting, and then uh, uh, assuming that the product is going to be submitted for licensure, there's pre-BLA meetings and other meetings uh, um, along the review cycle. And we'll say that the Oncology Center of Excellence input is uh, provided uh, at uh, all stages of uh, development from the pre-IND meeting to the BLA uh, review, uh, but not uh, for the interact meetings generally. This slide summarizes the cell therapies that have been approved for treatment of cancer. Prevenz was approved in 2010 for treatment of prostate cancer. Then we had uh, several of the gene-modified CAR T cells uh, that have been approved for uh, uh, hematologic malignancies, including Kimriya, Yascarta, Descartes, uh, and Brzezanti, which have been uh, approved over the past few years. In summary, gene-modified T cells show promise in cancer therapy, especially chimeric antigen uh, CAR T cells and TCR modified cells. Products are move, moving rapidly from the lab to the clinic. Toxicity is a concern. These products are complicated and many subcomponents. And also these are autologous cells, so each, each lot is in effect its own uh, separate product. And regulatory advice is available from CBER, OTAT, including pre-IND meetings, interact meetings, advanced therapies team, and uh, the various IND meetings, end of phase two, pre-PLA. So, poll question one, which type of meeting would not occur prior to an IND submission, interact meeting, pre-PLA, pre-IND, CAT? Answer is pre-PLA because uh, obviously, that's much later in clinical development. Poll question two, which primary endpoints are appropriate for first-in-human study, overall survival, safety, feasibility, progression-free survival? Answer is safety, feasibility, dose finding. These are links to some useful FDA information from the re regulatory process for OTAT and OTAT-LEARN. We have a webinar series and cell and three gene therapy guidances, and that's the expedited programs guidance and all of this you can find on Google. And I'd like to thank my uh, team in CBER, and uh, this is a picture of the uh, FDA campus uh, at dusk to remind everybody that our work does not end when the sun goes down. And this is contact information for me, uh, regulatory questions, and uh, the CEPR website. So thank you very much. But they may have more uh, efficacy and, and potency. And so uh, uh, there is not a big difference in terms of uh, uh, clinical um, uh, evaluation, safety evaluation of uh, the different generations. I hope that answers the questions. Um, then the next question was, uh, cytokine risk uh, requires hospitalization, uh, and would um, a certain level of cytokine risk, risk um, uh, be, uh, allow outpatient uh, administration? And I think one of the issues is that the cytokine risk may occur uh, a week or 10 days uh, following uh, administration of the CAR-T product. So uh, the, um, uh, it, uh, whether this is inpatient or outpatient, I think, uh, would depend on the experience of the particular uh, center. 
Uh, but uh, so, uh, many of the CAR-T studies are done as uh, outpatient, but the uh, patients have to stay close to the center uh, in case of trouble. Then um, the next question that I see uh, has to do with the contribution of component evidence uh, required. Um, and, and so this is uh, an, an interesting question. Um, so for an add-on study of um, uh, various uh, biologics, uh, it is uh, easier uh, to proceed with development of a, uh, say, a checkpoint inhibitor that is approved in a specific uh, indication. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, if you use a checkpoint inhibitor like uh, pembrolizumab or nivolumab for um, uh, melanoma and you have a product that is going to enhance the checkpoint inhibitor, it is simpler to proceed with the checkpoint inhibitor that is already approved in melanoma. Um, but uh, you need to discuss these uh, with uh, FDA. And um, conversions, body weight or body surface area. Uh, I don't think that we care whether it's uh, body weight or body surface area, but that does bring up an issue having to do with the uh, uh, the, the calculation of the dose of the CAR-T, and we do uh, want um, our sponsors to calculate the dose based on transduced cells, not the, rather than um, overall uh, cell uh, dose, because uh, the uh, transduction efficiency can uh, vary between 10% uh, and, say, 60 70%. And so um, it doesn't make any sense just to dose based on, on cell dose, but you can those based on body surface area or uh, uh, weight. And um, are we still required 15-year follow-up? Um, I think that needs to be just discussed on a case-by-case on uh, -case, uh, basis, but that's correct. And case cells uh, uh, do, not, um, uh, do not persist. So if a, uh, a product does not persist, then you don't need to to uh, do the 15-cell uh, year follow-up. But uh, some of the NK cells are uh, transduced with um, uh, gene-modified um, tran uh, transduced NK cells. So in that case, you would have to do the 15-year follow-up. Um, and then the question of the CAT meeting, uh, does it proceed? Uh, CAT meeting is uh, very early in um, clinical development. So. Um, the uh, CAT meeting may uh, proceed interact meeting, uh, but the CAT meeting is usually a manufacturing uh, uh, meeting, and uh, I think I provided the information how to get that. Um, uh, but I would like to say that the interact meetings tend and CAT meetings tend to be non-clinical and discussion of preclinical issues and uh, manufacturing issues, and there's usually relatively little. Uh, uh, clinical information, so a, a brief clinical synopsis is adequate, uh, whereas I would like to say for the pre-IND meeting uh, that the sponsors are missing an opportunity if you don't provide at least a good, um, uh, robust uh, clinical protocol synopsis um, uh, in uh, the um, pre-IND meeting. And um, so on, can I uh, discuss the role of the Oncology Center of Excellence in more detail? Are the retime all oncology reviews for products in CBER? Uh, that is a really interesting question. Um, the Oncology Center for Excellence, we work very closely uh, with um, uh, Jeff and his colleagues in Oncology Center for Excellence, and we discuss any licensure trial um, and um, uh, BLA uh, review with uh, uh, reviewers in the Oncology Center for Excellence. And, and there's always an OCE reviewer on, on any BLA uh, review uh, team um, and also um, uh, to discuss uh, protocols for, for um, licensure submission. Um, we have not yet uh, adopted the real-time oncology uh, review um, in uh, CBER, there's, it's more um, complex with the requirement for um, uh, product in, inspection. And so uh, thus far, uh, we don't think that the real-time oncology review is necessarily going to 
speed things along, um, the inspection uh, issues are, are fairly complicated. And I don't know if I have more time because I don't seem to have audio. Um, but if I did have more time, eight minutes, oh, okay. Then um, I can go to the issue of um, what are the common pitfalls that <clears throat> could result in IDs uh, going on hold. And uh, one of the uh, issues, I think, is um, uh, not requesting a pre-ID meeting. I think uh, that uh, sponsors ought to take uh, advantage of uh, what we currently um, is um, uh, free advice uh, that we um, uh, provide. Whereas in Europe, I think uh, they charge uh, uh, a fair amount for um, scientific advice. Here uh, in the good old USA, uh, we are providing free advice, pre-IND uh, advice, uh, uh, the uh, various um, end of phase one, end of phase two advice, special protocol assessment, and so forth. So uh, it's free advice, and I think sponsors ought to take advantage of it. And uh, I do think that uh, sponsors miss an opportunity for uh, interaction when you do not um, uh, submit a, uh, pro a fairly detailed protocol uh, with a, a pre-ID uh, submission. Um, and another uh, avoidable pitfalls is um, not uh, addressing or following uh, the FDA advice after you submit the IND we uh, would assume that you would follow our advice, and we find that many times um, sponsors do not follow our advice. And that's okay. The pre ID meeting is not, it's not binding. Um, however, it would be helpful if you don't want to follow our advice, that you provide documentation and justification for why you're not following our advice, because sometimes we see a, a, a submission with our pre-ID notes, and then the um, uh, submission and protocol has very little to do with what we suggested, and so we're left scratching our heads. Um, you know, uh, what are you guys thinking? So um, many sponsors will submit a fairly detailed point-by-point uh, uh, -point, uh, response to uh, the uh, pre-ID uh, um, comments and suggestions that uh, FDA made. And then uh, that's very helpful for uh, uh, review, and we may or may not um, agree, uh, but at least we know what you are thinking. And um, companion diagnostics are uh, reviewed in, um, this was an, another uh, question, um, and I touched on this briefly, uh, how are companion diagnostics reviewed, and what is a study risk determination, and I think I touched on that. Uh, briefly, but basically uh, the companion diagnostics are uh, assays that are uh, required for safe and effective use of a particular product. The classic one is, of course, HER2 and Herceptin and all the HER2-directed uh, uh, products. But now we have a number of products in uh, CBER, uh, the uh, TCR-directed um, uh, therapies that have a number of different um, uh, antigens uh, that are uh, the targets of these products, and um, including uh, MAGE A3, MAGE A4, NYESO, um, and uh, other uh, targets. I think one of my slides had a whole uh, list of them. And then more recently, there can be in individual personal personally uh, directed um, uh, uh, products that are, are identified through gene expression profiling. And uh, so for companion diagnostics, uh, these uh, require a, um, uh, a, an assay, and uh, these uh, are, uh, assays are regulated in the Center for Devices, and we, our approach to these is evolving uh, now. Uh, we used to do a, a study risk determination by the NSCDRH to do that, and now the review uh, offices in OCE, CDR and CBER are doing uh, the risk assessment, but we work closely with CDRH on uh, the uh, assessment of uh, the risk of these assays. And the concept is uh, is um, inclusion in the study um, 
does that involve, uh, involve uh, foregoing um, a standard of care or effective safe therapy? Um, and so uh, those are, uh, and also the toxicity of the product, and then if, uh, if biopsies are required. And um, do we have, uh, do we allow alternative dose binding designs, including accelerated titration and basin designs? And the answer is uh, yes, on a case by case uh, basis. But these, if you are going to uh, use an alternative uh, design, it would be helpful to have a pre ID to uh, make sure that we are in agreement with your dose escalation. And in general, as I mentioned, half log uh, dose uh, escalations are, are preferred to uh, log in increases, uh, but we will will um, consider these on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. Um, and um, do we have, uh, does CBER have different review standards compared with uh, CEDAR, OCE, and then are the standards coordinated? I think I touched on that. And so uh, we work very closely with um, CEDAR, OCE. And do we make, um, uh, special accommodations and clinical trial designs for rare diseases? And the answer is uh, yes. And in uh, selected instances, we will um, uh, allow a much uh, smaller uh, study um, in coordination with uh, experts in the particular uh, disease. And so we try to work uh, with the um, uh, disease uh, advocates uh, as well as our colleagues. Uh, in our OCE in order to uh, come up with a reasonable design to try to address uh, unmet med medical needs of rare diseases. And I think that is all I wanted to uh, talk about. And thank you all uh, so much for your attention.